We're in the storage room at the Royal Ontario Museum of the Painting Storage of the Anthropology Department. My name is Ken Lister. I'm an Assistant Curator of Anthropology here at the ROM. And the study that we're doing right now is on the Paul Kane collection. And Paul Kane was a, a Canadian artist, really the forerunner of Canadian art in, um, in Canada. And he traveled across the country between 1845 and 1848, came back with 600 sketches of landscapes and native people. And then for the next decade or so, he um, worked in a studio creating what we would consider to be romantic paintings. So he went from traveling to sketch, graphite, watercolor on paper, and oil on paper, and then in a studio to oil on canvas. And that was his record of mid-19th century native life. And what I'm particularly interested in is what does Paul Kane tell us about native culture in the mid-19th century? And the beauty of what we have at the ROM is we have his field sketches that we can compare to the oil paintings. And so that's one technique that we can look at in terms of asking the question, did he make a change when he went to the studio and made a studio painting? In some cases he did. The best evidence we have is his field sketches, like the archival record. That's the accuracy. In the studio painting, we're looking at for the changes because most people understand or know Kane because of his oil paintings, not his sketches. Now the project that we're doing here, the infrared, is looking in depth into the paint and what we're seeing are the changes that he made in the studio. And some of the information is, is, um, is amazing. In some cases, he represented the sketch accurately, but then in a studio, made a change and made the oil painting inaccurate. And that's very valuable for us to under, for us in terms of us thinking about Paul Kane, understanding his technique and his own thinking in his studio, and then ultimately the way in which we look upon Kane as a documentary painter in Canada uh, during the mid-19th century. Hi, I'm George Bevan of Queen's University. I'm in the Department of Classics as well as the Department of Art History and Art Conservation. We got into this project with the Royal Ontario Museum through a, a collaboration we already had in place to do infrared imaging of the ostraca from Greco-Roman Egypt in the ROMS collection. This was a natural extension of our capabilities into the area of 19th century Canadian art. For this project, and from a price performance standpoint, a converted uh, consumer camera was the way to go. Most consumer cameras have what's called an internal cutoff filter put in front of the silicon sensor. This in fact cuts out a lot of the wavelengths of light in the infrared spectrum that we're interested in. Uh, for the project, we're using a quartz fluorite lens uh, made by Coastal Optics of Jupiter, Florida. One of its main features is that the quartz fluorite glass allows the full transmission of UV visible and infrared light without any dissipation, such as found with uh, regular glass. When you shoot infrared, the focus settings cannot be taken over from visible light. So in other words, if I focus in the visible spectrum and I put an opaque infrared filter in front of the lens, I have to, on most normal lenses, change the focus. This is not the case for this lens. This means that we can work quickly and accurately and get images that are tack sharp from edge to edge. The other aspect of our infrared setup that deserves note here is that rather than using fixed tungsten or halogen sources, constant halogen sources, such as um, this light here, a, a tungsten spotlight, uh, we instead have adapted consumer level strobes uh, that are available for less than $100. We put in front of this xenon bulb a infrared filter to gives us a very pure infrared light and we remotely trigger it from the camera. Hello, I'm Ian Longo from Queen's University. I'm an undergraduate student in the Classics Department. So when we take our photographs uh, in infrared, we first have to upload them to the, a computer 
and uh, so we're able to digitally enhance and interpret these photographs. Um, we first interpret the photograph as a, a red photograph. After we've converted this image to a monochromatic format, we're able to enhance the levels, which therefore will enhance the contrast of this image, so the finer details become more visible. My name is Heidi Sobel, I'm the Senior Paintings Conservator here at the ROM, and the IR project that we're going through right now started out, um, we were looking for paintings in the collection that we knew kind of had something to give us. Couldn't exactly see it, we did see some pentimenti, uh, textural and visual, but we wanted to take a look at all the paintings in the collection, and we knew we had a good survey, we had them all. And this was a great way to do it in a finite amount of time with a specific number of equipment. We were allowed to try out different types of IR capabilities during this project, which is exciting because then we get to see the value of each of them and what can yield and what can't, especially with a series of paintings such as we have them. IR information, along with other diagnostic things that we do to paintings, such as UV examination, x-radiography, and simple visual examination, gives the conservator um, an, an arsenal of information to approach a treatment. The Kane collection in the ROM, although we've had it for a very long time, exhibits a variety of different treatments over the past 50 to 100 years. Some of them are pristine, have never been treated before, others have been overly treated. Higher information is a great way of documenting and mapping out where old damages may have been and helps us to interpret the surface. If we're reading something that we may think is a damage, which is actually an underpainting, that helps us make a determination and not to think it's overpaint, not to go ahead and, and remove that or um, question it.